We all love coming to zoos, especially this one here at London Zoo, the world's most famous one around the world. One of the many reasons that we come here is to entertain ourselves to see all the different animals from far places such as Africa and Asia. But have you ever thought about other reasons what London Zoo does? We are here today at London Zoo to speak to people to find this out. Two teams that do that. We've got um, a team called Conservation Programme, so they protect the animals out there in the wild. So they go all over the world. We work in about 50 different countries all around the world. So I think that picture is actually taken in Sumatra, in Indonesia. So those, uh, those teams of people, they go out there and try and work with the local people in those countries where the animals come from. And we've also got scientists working in labs here at the zoo as well. So you might walk past their uh, labs and not even know they're there. But they're looking at things like microscopes, finding out about animals that have diseases and why they have diseases, um, and then trying to find out cures for those diseases. So a bit like a working hospital as well. We've also got a team of vets that are part of that as well. So science out in the wild. So I said that we send teams out, teams of um, scientists that go out to do uh, conservation work out in the wild. So they do population surveys, so they count the number of animals of a certain species out in the wild. They identify animals and track them. So sometimes they will tag them. Have you ever seen people tagging animals? Yeah, so they might tag things like sharks and lions and things like that. Um, and that means that if you tag them, you can uh, keep a track of where it goes and what it gets up to, whether it comes into conflict with any humans and things like that. Um, and it's a very good way of finding out lots about the animals without actually being there. So if you're tracking them, you probably can get all that information in your computer. It's very, very good. Uh, they find out about their ecology, so how things work together and how they link, so animals that they're studying with the other animals in that same habitat and the plants and the, um, everything around them. And very importantly, working with local people. So it's horns, so the horns on the rhino, sometimes they have one, sometimes they have two. And a bit like the tiger bones, that's grounded into a powder to use as medicine uh, in some traditional um, cultures as well. So rhinos, elephants and big cats, very quick one about breeding. That's what I was hoping for. Normally it's everyone does in chorus. Oh. So this one is Hari. Uh, he no longer lives here at London Zoo. So because we are part of that team of zoos called Biaza and Waza, um, he's actually now living at Perth Zoo in Australia. So he was moved there. But we have got two um, tigers. One of them is related to Hari. It's in fact his daughter. So the female that we've got here at the moment is uh, called Malate and that's Hari's daughter. She came all the way from Perth and her boyfriend JJ came from um, the US in Ohio. And we put them together using our breeding program. And I'll explain how that goes in just a second. Um, but first, we're going to try um, and decide what very, very... I think this might have been for Valentine's Day, I'm not sure. So we try to put our animals together, but there's lots of things that we need to consider before we let animals breed at a zoo. So what do you think we might need to think about? really quickly. They what, kill each other. Yeah, so their behaviour, how aggressive they are, especially with big animals like tigers and lions, definitely need to consider whether they're going to kill each other. So how they get on, their behaviour, what else? Really simple stuff. Right back to basics. Are they taste? Are they, are they physically fit? Size? Physically fit, <laughs> size, these are all good, but even more basic than that. Perfect mate, does it work? Does it work? Yes. Yeah. So are they healthy enough to reproduce? No, that's fine. Even more basic than that. So obviously we need to put male and female, so that's very basic. But which males and females must we never put together? Oh, the same breed. No, they need to be the same breed, same species. We can't put related animals together because obviously that will affect their genetic diversity <laughs> later on and that can cause a lot of health problems as you might be aware just like in humans so in uh, the animal groups at the zoos around the world we have to make sure if we're moving them around between those zoos that they never meet uh, their relatives for a breeding purpose okay or even if it's not for a breeding purpose they can't really be in the same enclosure if they're capable of breeding okay so that might end up in disaster so we have to take all these considerations um, to try and choose the male and the female it's quite a complicated pro process and uh, lots of people work on different animals so each species of animal that is part of a breeding program so if they're endangered they'll have one person at a zoo around the world that will coordinate who uh, breeds with who so they'll pick males and females of each species to, to be together so we at once we've had lots of um 
animals breeding. Um, we've obviously looked at how we choose animals to breed, so we've chosen the right ones. And when they've had nice, healthy and diverse babies, so none of them are related, uh, we might start to think about reintroducing animals out into the wild. So to replenish those populations that we know are very, very low. Um, what kind of thing do you think we might need to think about before starting to take animals back? Very good. So if we said the problem's humans, what's going to happen if we put one of these cubs, one of these Sumatran tiger cubs, back into Sumatra when it's a uh, full-grown age? It will just get killed. So the poachers, it's probably going to be easier prey to kill than um, one that's wild-born. So we need to make sure that the problem is solved first. So we've worked with the local communities, and they've got maybe a protected area to start with and things like that, and we're keeping an eye on those things. What else do you think we might need to think about? Um, food. So how are they going to catch their food? Now, uh, we're not allowed to feed, in the UK at least, we're not allowed to feed live animals to our vertebrates. Live vertebrates to our animals, sorry. So we, um, the carnivores have to be fed dead meat, okay? And hopefully I'll find that video later on to show you. Um, so we need to use lots of inventive ways to try and feed them and keep them interested because obviously naturally they would hunt. But we technically can't legally um, teach them how to hunt something live in a zoo. So we have to make sure that they know how to hunt. So maybe have a few steps rather than just throwing them out into the jungle. We can have them in a closed reserve, maybe start off with some dead food, maybe a live uh, animal where, in a country that's legal to do that and make sure that they can hunt. And then when we're happy, we can let them out into the wild. Yeah. What is your role in the 21st century as a zoo? So our mission is actually based on conserving and protecting uh, animals around the world and their wild and their habitats. So. Keep special species like endangered animals. So we try and breed as many endangered animals as we possibly can. We learn of how to breed them and how to keep them in a zoo environment from studying them out in the wild. What's your most important endangered animals that you have here today? I'd probably say the most iconic one that raises a lot of uh, money for fundraising and to invest back into their conservation is probably the Sumatran tigers who have recently bred. <laughs> and what is the most rare animal on the whole planet that you've like is there any places you guys have had to help out around the world to save animals yeah so we currently are involved with um a snail <laughs> reintroduction prog program doesn't sound as exciting but it's called the partula snail and uh, they're very very small snails and they're actually extinct in the wild so there's none of them left in polynesia where they originated so we've got a breeding program just there in that building in bugs um and we're hoping to reintroduce them very very soon into polynesia okay perfect thank you thank you Thanks. Thank you.